So there's three things I'd like to address in terms of misconceptions of addressable advertising. I'd first start with that addressable TV is not efficient. Uh, it's too it's too inefficient from a CPM standpoint. Through education, we're, we're you know we're uh, getting. Uh, advertisers to understand what an e ECPM is, the effective CPM. Because when you extrapolate the waste, the universe shrinks and your CPM goes up. Addressable CPMs are uh, comparable to prime time CPMs in the 40s and the 50s, and they have gotten cheaper over the last four to five years. So addressable is never going to play a role, play the key role in a media plan. It's always going to be complementary. So when you extrapolate the, uh, take away the waste, that CPM will go up. The same thing would happen if you did that to a cable buy or if you did that to a broadcast prime buy. The next one I'd like to address is there, it lacks scale. Uh, the advertisers that are using addressable most effectively are using the entire addressable footprint. That represents anywhere from 70 to 75 million households. Used as a complement to the overall media buy, 70 to 75 million households uh, is significant scale. So it's the advertisers that are using one or maybe two uh, partners that are not realizing the scale that's out there. It's the advertisers that are using all of this. So the scale's there, and it's never going to take the place, as I said earlier, of the overall, overall media buy. It's going to complement that. And 75 million households to start with is significant. The last uh, misconception I'd like to touch on is uh, that addressable advertising is only for upscale advertisers. We've had a lot of success with many upscale advertisers in terms of moving the needle from a targetability standpoint, from a back-end measurement standpoint, but we've also had a lot of success with non-upscale advertisers, whether that be CPG, whether that be home improvement, whether that be entry-level basic insurance. So very appropriate you know, for upscale advertisers, but there's a lot that can be done for someone who's not necessarily an upscale advertiser. Uh, just looking at the auto categories, one example, we do advertising with entry level models, 15, 20,000. We have mid, mid tier sedans, 40, 50,000, all the way up to 100,000 plus high performance sports cars. So it, it really can work for a range of advertisers. The auto category is clearly one that has embraced address, addressable advertising. One example, I'll just give you one example, where we able to measure uh, and drive people through uh, to their website versus this sequence of ads which would drive them into the showroom. So it's learnings like that, very, very you know, impactful. That's just one example where you see, you see uh, uh, addressable's you know, true ability to, to drive and to pinpoint that target uh, and actually track them through not just the addressable but through the overlay of data to tr track them through their digital journey as well and how the addressable campaign works in conjunction with that. Well, there's a lot of data-driven buy, TV buying going on and that's a combination of data-driven linear or what's also called index buying. Uh, there's also addressable. There's also a lot, a good portion of the marketplace whether that be clients or whether that be agencies who think they're buying addressable when they're buying index buying. So what I see is with increased education in the marketplace you're going to see more of those budgets that are right now in data-driven linear or index buys convert. We're starting to see more of them converting some, of, some or all of their budgets into addressable. And a lot of them are testing, testing the combination of data-driven linear along with addressable and looking to see what works best for them in terms of their attribution model or their optimizations. The other trend we see, and we, we see it in certain categories, but we see it as a growing trend across multiple categories, is addressable being looked at uh, as part of the core strategic planning process. So it becomes a line item at the front end. More and more advertisers are asking us for information at the beginning of the planning process as opposed to midstream or even towards the end. It's much more proactive versus reactive. We have programmatic uh, in the OTT space and we also have programmatic in the satellite space. Uh, in the OTT space it's Sling TV uh, and Sling TV works within an ecosystem that, that VMPTVs uh, of about 6.7 million homes. Sling is right now in 2.3 million homes. The advertiser who has some fluidity with their budgets 
and has insights into their weekly, their week to week, either GRP levels as it relates to the sales levels, who have that flexibility can use it very, very effectively. Sling TV is really the, 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 the best of both those worlds in terms of TV and digital. You have 100% uh, viewability, you have none of the downside to, 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 to digital. Zero bots, so zero fraud, and you have the engagement of TV. So you have this full screen experience, you have that engagement uh, like experience, but you have all the, the targetability and the measurement and the optimization tools that digital brings. So it's really a good mix of that. On the satellite side, we have, we're starting to close the gap in terms of get, giving our, our partners insight into our, our, our inventory over the next two, three, four days. It is not real time, there's no real time bidding on the satellite side, but that's something we're working towards and that's a, an innovation that DISH is definitely looking to accomplish called over the next uh, 12 to 18 months.